Hi, I'm Max Walker-Williams, and today I'm making a video that I feel I really shouldn't have to. And so basically what happened uh, is that a guy called Vasco Shot, a friend of mine, left a comment on one of my YouTube videos saying, hi Max, thanks for the, you know, for the content, etc. Can you check out this video by a guy called Ryan Matt? And so I had a look at the video by this YouTuber, who has 90,000 subscribers, by the way, about Hadira Hashgraph. And in the video, he says that Hedera Hashgraph is the most, uh, is the worst um, cryptographic platform there is. And in fact, it's so bad that it really shouldn't be calling itself a cryptographic platform at all. It doesn't deserve in the crypto environment. And that obviously really got me, you know, got me charged up. And I thought, wow, what the heck has happened to this guy uh, that means that he, he feels this way about Hedera Hashgraph? And he's clearly not an idiot. He must know what he's talking about because he has 90,000 subscribers on YouTube. And so I watched the video. And at the end of the video, I was really disappointed and I, I felt compelled for three main reasons to make this video as a rebuttal to his video. And the, re the three reasons I felt compelled was, number one, um, he's got 90,000 subscribers. So he's not talking to himself. It's very, very important that what he says is true and accurate because he's talking to a lot of people and people make decisions, investment decisions, life decisions off the back of that video. So that was number one. And number two, as you'll see from some of his content that I'll put in this video so that you can hear it uh, from the horse's mouth, as it, as it were, his content is aimed at a much younger audience, probably children. He splices in, you know, puking, smiley faces, uh, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, a lot of wrestler videos. He seems to like really like wrestler videos. So he's obviously aiming his content at a much younger audience. And children don't have the critical thinking that a lot of adults do. So to me, it's really important. They're starting out in their life, they're you know, making decisions. I'm gonna do a business, which platform, etc. So I think it's really important that they hopefully get to see a counter argument to Ryan's video so that they can make a more formed decision because they might not have the nous yet, and I, I don't wanna do any disservice to any young people, but they might be less likely than adults to go off and do more research on something and take everything this guy says uh, you know, as given, as fact despite the fact, you know, because he has 90,000 followers, but despite the fact that he says at the very beginning of his own video that nothing he says is fact. The second, uh, sorry, the third reason I want to make this video is because I made another video um, about a, another YouTuber called Oz Crypto. And the re net result of me creating that video, just sort of giving um, Oz Crypto some context, he made a video about why he sold all his HBAR, and he did so, in my opinion, in error. So I made a video explaining why I believe that, and I'll put a link to that video in the description below. And the net result of that on Twitter mainly was that OzCrypto, I think, was emotionally intelligent enough to kind of retract and, and say, you know, maybe I've made some same mistakes. So if I can have a similar outcome here, that'd be absolutely fantastic. And at the very least, at least you watching this have a counter argument to Ryan Matt's video. So the video doesn't get off to a great start, to be honest, because Matt misspells HBAR. So HBAR is H-B-A-R, pretty simple, straightforward. In the very beginning of Matt's video, he spells it H hyphen B-A-R. So we're not off to a great start. Uh, I, I don't want to nitpick, and it, you know, it's just not a great start. When you've got 90,000 subscribers, you think it's a pretty professional outfit. Uh, maybe it's a mistype, maybe it's an error, but he does do it twice at the very beginning, as you've probably just seen. And so it's not a great start, but putting that aside, the first mistake and one of the biggest mistakes that Ryan makes is that he couples Hedera Hashgraph with all other DAGs. DAG stands for Directed Acyclical Graph, and it is, Hedera Hashgraph is a DAG. It is a Directed Acyclical Graph, but it's completely different to all of the others out there that I've ever seen. And we see this all the time. So it's a bit like Ryan has made a video about the bad things about petrol cars, and he's using all these examples of petrol cars when talking about a Tesla. So he's saying petrol's flammable, you know, gas is flammable, um, it's expensive, it's hurting the environment. And then, but using those as examples for why a Tesla isn't very good. And although yes, a Tesla and a Volkswagen are both cars, you shouldn't really be comparing them when you're talking about the fuel they run on because it's completely different. And that is exactly, in my opinion, what Ryan does. And I can prove this pretty simply because if Hadira Hashgraph isn't any different to all of the other um, directed acyclical graphs or GAT DAGs, why and how were they able to get a patent? So they've got a worldwide patent on this invention, on this technology, and to have a patent, it's got to be unique. You can't just go around patenting things that already exist. You can't patent stuff that's too similar to something else. And the bar 
to getting uh, you know, the standard, to getting a, a patent a successfully um, awarded, which Hadira Hashcraft did, is pretty high. It's got to be really, really unique, and you've got to, it's got to be provably unique. And Hadira Hashcraft got the patent. So the first quite obvious question is, if these are all the same, how come that one's got a patent, and why aren't these guys challenging it or just copying the stuff anyway? Well, the obvious answer is that Hedera Hashcraft is completely unique in its own right. Of all the crypto platforms, 16, 15, 20,000 crypto platforms there are out there, Hedera Hashcraft is the only one with patented technology. So that already sort of makes me worried that Ryan doesn't even have a basic understanding of how Hedera Hashcraft works because he's comparing it to things that aren't, really aren't suitable. And I'll give you an example of this. Ryan says that he looks at a, a paper, he says he puts a link to it in the description below, but he doesn't, but I managed to find it on the internet and I read the whole thing. And what the paper is saying is very true of the projects it's talking about, but it's not talking about Hadira Hashcraft. And basically one of the things it's saying is that it's very hard to scale with the DAG because the architecture, and I don't want to get too you know, bedded down with, with geeky technology, with geeky explanations and stuff, but basically a DAG, generally speaking, the architecture, the way it's structured is horizontal meaning in a line. So it's like um, one person passing a message to another person, to another person, to another person, to another person. Once you try to do that and it's a massive line of people, it becomes a problem. There are security risks, there, you know, there's, there's, there's time risks in terms of uh, the, the time it takes for a transaction to complete, starts to, to get out of hand, and there are loads of other issues. But Hadira Hashgraph's structure, its architecture, is far more horizontal. And the gossip about gossip protocol means that isn't fundamentally isn't how Hadira Hashcraft works. It's gossip about gossip. All of the nodes know what all of the nodes know, and they know exactly who they heard it from, who they heard it from, and the time. Gossip about go gossip protocol. And that is a fundamental a key point about Hadira Hashcraft. And if you want to learn more about that, very simply, I'm hoping Ryan's watching this, I'll put a link to the description below about a video I made explaining how Hadira Hashcraft works to my 84-year-old father. And I hope that'll help you understand the difference between Hadira Hashcraft and the comparisons that Ryan is making. Let's start with the fact that HBAR is a DAG. It is not a blockchain, which means that there is no linking of blocks. Let's swing over to Radix DLT and take a look at an article called why DAGs can't scale without centralization. Ryan then goes on to do something that Oz Crypto, a mistake that Oz Crypto also made, and that's that he used theory and applied it to real life. And what I mean is he says, one of the issues with Hadira Hashgraph is that if you get over 34% of the HBAR, you then have control of over 34% of the network, and you can therefore corrupt the network, change the order of transactions, change the rules, and change fundamentals, crash the network. These actors only need to gain over 33% of the total hash power to attack the network, and that's even before it's sharded. Which in theory is true. I have a couple of problems with this argument. The first and biggest one being that to acquire 34% of all the HBAR in circulation is I want to say impossible, but I have to hold myself back because nothing's impossible technically. So it's impossible, okay? And I, I explain in the video towards crypto, and again, I'll put a link to the description below to that one, in a really basic and simple way to understand that history has proven that trying to corner an asset market through purchase is impossible. And many men and women have tried and gone bankrupt and, and faced ruin trying. So for Ryan just to throw away and equip that, you know, they're vulnerable to 34% attack because people can buy HBAR and then control the network, it's just not applicable to real life and it's just a nonsense. And anyone who has even the basic understanding of economics, cryptographic technology, assets or history will know that this is just a non-issue, it's a non-starter. Non the other thing that Ryan goes on to say in the same sort of breath is that he has serious concerns about Hadira Hashcraft's security when it comes to the number of transactions. And this really piqued my interest because it wasn't something I was aware of or, or had heard of it put this way before. And it's, uh, it's, quite un it's quite unique to Ryan. And that is that if there aren't enough transactions on the network, then it's vulnerable to, to attack. This is fundamentally untrue with Hadira Hashcraft. The nodes can sit there doing nothing and they're no more or less vulnerable to attack. It's complete nonsense. But it got me thinking, well, how many transactions is Hadira Hashcraft completing now? I hadn't had a look in a while, so I thought I'd go back because Ryan was talking about one to two transactions per second and there are other completely incompatible, unrelated, unrelative um, platforms that are DAGs to Hadira Hashcraft that are uh, supposedly, according to Ryan, are having to sort of do in-house transactions to keep the number up to keep the network safe. I don't think that's true, but you know that's my opinion, it's not a fact. 
And so I had a look. So is Hedera Hashgraph more vulnerable if there aren't enough transactions on the network? Absolutely not. But is that even, is it an academic point anyway? Is it even relative? Because is Hedera Hashgraph doing enough transactions that mean it isn't at risk if it were? So I had a look. And you can do this for yourself on Hedera, uh, on Dragonglass, and I'll put a link in the description below to that website. Since the mainnet went live on the 17th of the 8th, 2019, there have been 2.592 billion transactions, or 2,124,590 transactions a day. So that's 1,220 days the mainnet's been live, and in that time, every day for 1,220 days consecutive, Hedera Hashcraft has completed 2,124,590 transactions. Wow. And the other thing I'd say, just a sort of side note on that, is that as the network's been growing and growing, it's it's the the I don't know for a fact, but if I ch I'm pretty sure if I checked, the lion's share of those transactions will be later on too. So not only is Hadira Hashgraph doing over 2 million transactions a day, and has been doing every day successfully for 1,220 days consecutive, those number of transactions is going up, not down. So the lion's share of those transactions will have been in the, in, in the last year or two. And so, why make the point? Because the point isn't true, and even if it were true, how is that a risk to Hedera that's completing those sort of transactions? In fact, Hedera Hashgraph has now completed more transactions, mainnet and testnet, than all of the other uh, cryptographic projects put together. So it just kind of really demonstrates how confused I was watching Ryan's video, and how misplaced his concerns about Hedera Hashgraph really are. Ryan then goes on to talk about timestamping which is obviously a very, very important thing when it comes to cryptographic technology, because you need to know when the transactions happened and in what order and at what time so that you have continuity on the ledger. Ryan claims that this is basically impossible on Hedera Hashgraph and that there's no way of seeing a singular verifiable list of transactions on the Hedera network and that of those transactions, there's no way of timestamping them. No verifiable guaranteed list of transactions in any timestamped order. Which is a complete nonsense. You only need to go on hash, uh, Dragonglass, and you can. And I've been there loads of times myself in videos, as you know, if you watch my content, to see a coherent list of all the transactions that have happened on Hedera Hashgraph and the exact time they happened. I can't remember, if I'm, I'm always honest with you, I can't remember exactly how accurate Hedera Hashgraph is, but I think it's the thousandth of a second. So it's super, super accurate. And when you think about it, it has to be. One of the governing council members is Ubisoft, the largest gaming manufacturer in the world with over 10,000 uh, full-time software engineers in-house. That is massive. And they're talking and, and, and aiming towards moving seriously large games onto the Hedera Hashgraph network. Now, if you, do, if you can't get the order right, then it makes gaming on the Hedera Hashgraph network impossible. So I fire a gun at you, you fire a gun at me, who pulled the trigger first, what upgrades has my gun got, what armor are you wearing, and all that stuff has to be tracked in real time in order for the game to work. If you dive out of the way of a bullet or you duck, did you duck before the bullet hit you or did the bullet hit you first? All of these data points need to be recorded and they need to be done in, in a way that is succinct. And as the gaming industry gets bigger and bigger, and actually some of the prize money now is, is, is you know, like Hollywood actor sort of wages, it really, really matters. And Ubisoft is developing on the Hedera Hashcraft network as a governing council member. Neuron, the largest drone operator in the UK, has just got its first license from the Aviation Society to fly real live test case drone deliveries for the likes of Amazon. And so they're collecting hundreds of thousands of data points in real time. How are they doing that if timestamping isn't a thing on Hedera Hashgraph? How would that even be possible? And why would they even try? Why would Ubisoft spend money and time developing on a network that doesn't work according to Ryan? And finally, the NHS were tracking COVID vaccines in transit temperatures of them in real time. Now, if those temperatures go above or below certain remit, people die. But the life of, and no one did, by the way, I'd like to, uh, thankfully, um, the, but the, the, literally the people's lives are in the hands of this technology that is tracking COVID van, uh, vaccines in transit in real time. Again, tens, if not hundreds of thousands of data points in real time. 
how, how, I don't understand. And you don't even need to know much about Hedera Hashgraph to see any one of these use cases and say, hang on, if what Ryan's saying true there, if that's true, how is that possible? As the video goes on, Ryan starts to cover other subjects, but he refers back to the 34% attack problem, which, as I've explained in this video, and in more detail in the video I did for Oz Crypto, is just not a, a, a plausible uh, problem in real life, only in theory. And some crypto influencers, unfortunately, can't seem to see the difference between real life where we all live and invest and our money is, and theory. And he starts talking about other DAG projects, some of them are uh, really, really uh, obscure. Uh, Byteball, he starts saying, well, Hadira Hashgraph, Byteball have got this problem and they've got these things called witness nodes. Um, and they've got 12 witness nodes, which keeps the, the, the structure, the platform centralized. And that's the way that they're gonna protect against the 34% attack. He makes no example or reference whatsoever to what Hadira Hashgraph is doing in order to solve this problem. And the reason he does that is because there isn't a problem on Hedera Hashgraph. So there is no example for him to give you. So he says, Hedera Hashgraph has this problem. And this is how Byteball, a project I have to admit I'd never heard of um, before uh, watching Ryan's video. This is how Byteball are solving that problem. And this is how IOTA are solving this problem. But he doesn't say how Hedera is solving this problem because it isn't a problem. Byteball, for example, another DAG, has 12 witness nodes. IOTA has the coordinator. The next point Ryan brings up is the SEC. And I have to say, this is a very unique concern to Ryan. I hadn't heard this one before, but it did make me think and it was interesting. And what Ryan says is that because people know who the nodes are, who the operators and the owners of the nodes are, they could be held to account, which I think is a great thing because I wanna know who I'm dealing with. I wanna know if something happens on the Hedera network, I wanna be able to go to somebody and say, what's going on and hold people to account. So I think that's a good thing. But Ryan twists that on its head, and it's a very fair point, um, you know, to, to give him his credence, it's a very fair point. He, Ryan says that the SEC could and might and probably will approach the governing council members of Hedera and bully them into blocking out transactions by Russia or blocking out transactions to people that the SEC don't like. Although I, I can see that why Ryan might think that's a possibility, I completely disagree. And the reason I disagree is, first of all, let's say it was to happen today. That means that the SEC is gonna call or write to the London College of Economics and tell them that they're not allowed to allow transactions through by a Russian company. Well, why does the SEC have authority over the London School of Economics? And surely the London School of Economics is gonna raise that concern with the SEC and say, we're in a completely different country. But even if they didn't, it's clear to me from the whole video that Ryan hasn't read the Hadira Hashgraph white paper. I don't even think he's seen the front cover of it. Because if he had of, Ryan would know that very shortly, as, part of their, as, as per their white paper, Hadira Hashgraph, although they started the platform with complete centralization, with just one node, you know, with Swirls, uh, with Hadira Hashgraph at the time, then a governing council, one day uh, 39 members, 39 nodes, then the second phase of the plan is to go to community nodes. So allowing people who are known to Hadira Hashgraph and trusted, hopefully people like me one day, to run a node. And then the third and final phase of the rollout of Hadira Hashgraph is completely open access nodes to anybody. So you can, you can operate a Hadira Hashgraph node on a Raspberry Pi and not be known to Hadira Hashgraph. So if the SEC don't get their skates on, because at the moment, he, Ryan is absolutely right, we do know who's running the nodes, and the SEC, in theory, could approach them, and maybe, even though Standard Banks in Africa, Shinhan Banks in, 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 in the East, and, and all of these different companies are so diverse, you know, charities, uh, educational uh, institutions, businesses, I really can't see the SEC being able to bully, you know, the, the council members into doing what they want. And I think there'd be a public outcry if they did and get Hadira Hashgraph a lot of media attention. But they get, need to get their skates on because in a minute, I'm going to have a node, hopefully. Well, are the SEC going to find out where I am, where I live, whatever, and then send me a letter? And then what are they going to threaten me with? And if they really don't get their skates on in a minute, there's going to be so many nodes that they're not going to be able to do it, even if it was a plausible thing, which I don't think it is. The second half of the problem that I have with Ryan's point is how do... The, so let's say the SEC say, right, we want no, you, we, you cannot facilitate any transactions from Russia. How do they know? 
How, how, will, how will the London School of Economics, now they've been bullied by the SEC in a different country to, to do as they're told, how would they know where the transactions are coming from and who's doing them? Because we can't even get a handle on money laundering in the world, let alone digital transactions through VPNs and everything else. So again, I just think it's a bit of a fundal, it's a, it's a very top layer worry that's presented as a real threat. But when you actually just do one inch of research into the top, the points that Ryan's raising, you just see that there's no problem there. There's no issue. How, how in the real world is that going to be a thing where the SEC start contacting nodes that they don't know who's operating, all of them, and convince all of these people they don't know and can't contact to not allow Russian transactions? And how am I going to know the difference between a Russian transaction and a Ukrainian transaction? It's just a nonsense. Things really start to heat up seven or eight minutes into Ryan's video, and he now goes on to one of my favorite topics, which is centralization. I made a video very recently about is Hadira uh, centralized or decentralized? I'll put a link to that video below if you want to learn more about centralized Hadira versus decentralized Hadira hashgraph, which I think uh, it is and why. But basically, Ryan says that, look, here's Kevin O'Leary, and he literally named Kevin O'Leary. Here's Mr. Wonderful, here's Kevin O'Leary, but I call him Mr. Centralized. And the reason Ryan calls him Mr. Centralized is because that he believes that Kevin O'Leary owns a company that runs one of the nodes at Hadira Hashgraph. So being that at the moment, all of the governing council are the ones and Swirls and Hadira Hashgraph are operating nodes, which one of those governing council members uh, is, Hadira, is Kevin O'Leary's business? Ryan doesn't say, he doesn't name the business, but he just says, Kevin O'Leary owns a business that's running a node on the Hadira network. So let's use Kevin O'Leary as an example. Most of you guys call him Mr. Wonderful. I call him Mr. Validator or Mr. Centralized. His company is running an HBAR validator, which is why you see him promoting HBAR in almost every video. So if we pull up HBAR's governing council, you can see a list of companies and organizations who are running validators on HBAR. Which one is it, Ryan? Because I, I don't think he owns Google. I don't think he owns LG. I don't think he owns uh, the uh, University of College London. Um, I don't think he owns the London School of Economics. So sincere question, if that's true, and you said it, it's your fact, which one of the governing council members does Kevin O'Leary own? Because I can't find anything anywhere that confirms what you said. Ryan demonstrates his fundamental lack of understanding, the most basic understanding of Adira Hashgraph at seven minutes and 50 seconds into the video, where he says that HBARs are still being minted. These are the people that are making all of the newly minted HBAR coins that are dumped out into circulation every month that depreciate the value of your investment. Well, anyone who knows anything about Hadira Hashgraph knows that in the, in the very beginning, the 50 billion HBAR that is the total cap were created in one go by Lehman Amants in a Starbucks in America. So it, it's a very small point and maybe he misspoke, but I'm getting all of these signals that here is a man that lacks a very, very basic fundamental understanding of how Hadira Hashgraph works to the point that he doesn't even realize all of the HBARs have already been minted. This is proven further by the fact that Ryan says that there are 39 nodes currently on the network. 39 different parties running validators. And bearing in mind that Ryan's made this video with the motive of discrediting Hadira Hashgraph. So anything that makes it look more centralized is gonna be great for Ryan. And yet he still, he doesn't even realize that there are 39 governing council member places, but only 27 of those have been filled so far. So had he have wanted to make Hadira Hashgraph look more um, centralized, which is exactly his argument, and had he have done a tiny bit of research and just counted the number of governing council members, he'd know there's 27 nodes in operation, not the 39. Again, that's not a problem because there are more governing council members coming to the network soon. And again, phase two, we go to community nodes as well. Phase three, nodes for anybody who wants to run one. So it just emphasizes the point again that Ryan really does lack a fundamental understanding of how Hadira Hashgraph works. Could you imagine if there was only 39 miners out there mining Bitcoin, trying to convince people that that's decentralized? What Ryan's talking about there is Bitcoin circa pre-2019. Today, as you'll know if you follow any of my content on Twitter or here on YouTube, Bitcoin, uh, Cornell University did a two-year research paper, completely independent, with several PhD maths professors and e economic uh, men and women involved in the research. 
And the research paper, which I'll put a link to the description in below, found Bitcoin to be one of, if not the most centralized cryptographic platforms there is on earth. In fact, less than 20 entities control more than 85% of the hashing power on Bitcoin. And in fact, two men, the owner of Finpool and F2Pool, control more than 65% of the hashing power. So Ryan is saying on one hand, can you imagine how ridiculous Bitcoin would be if people were trying to say it's decentralized with 39 node operators? And in reality, Bitcoin is operated, or 85% of the hashing power, go and check for yourself, this is not me saying it, it's Cornell University, it's a fact, 85, more than 85% of the hashing power on Bitcoin is controlled by less than 20 entities on earth and two men, both in China, owner of F2Pool and Finpool. And the reason the China comment's important is because they're both in the same place. Because at least you could say, well, one's in China and one's in America, they've never met. Two guys who are presumably very close together, close to each other, they have met previously, they're in the same company in the same country, which is tightly controlled country, control more than 65% of the hashing power on Bitcoin. About 10 minutes into the video, Ryan really gets himself into a bit of a muddle and gets quite confused. Um, he starts editing out his own voice, so it's really hard to work out what he's talking about. He directly contradicts himself. He says that inflation on Hedera is at 387%, but at the same time as saying it, he writes 680%. He, he edits out his own voice and just says billions and writes 11 billion. So it's really hard for me to critique this part of the video and it wouldn't be fair on Ryan to do so because he's in such a muddled mess that I, I don't know which one he means. Uh, and so I, it's hard for me to comment. And so I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt and just skip this bit of the video out. But I'm gonna show you a clip now so you can say I'm not being facetious, this is sincere. It wouldn't be fair. You know, if somebody says one number and writes another number, what, you know, I, there's not much I can do with that. And to be quite honest with you, in this part of the video, and I think it's out of Ryan's frustration with his inability to grasp the numbers, he calls all of the people who work at Hedera, who've invested in Hedera, and you know, sort of anything to do with that ecosystem as ball lickers. And I think Ryan really lets himself down there. I know he, you know, he's trying to appeal to kids, younger audience, but I think it's a real shame because that, to me, sort of lacks professionalism and a fundamental lack of respect for people in the space who, whether you like the platform or not, whether you think it's great or not, the people who are working there are probably working incredibly hard and believe, uh, and believe in it. And they're trying, in their, in their own views, they're trying to create something fantastic. They're, they're, it's sincere, their work is sincere. And, and he refers to them as that. So I think that's a real shame and, and, and Ryan lets himself down. But again, I, I do think that that clip is just from his own frustration at not being able to get a grasp on the numbers because he is all over the shop. Have a look. HBAR put in a new all-time high at 47 cents. At that point in time, there were over billion coins of HBAR released out into circulation, guys. That is an inflation rate of 387%. So, in the last bit of the video, Ryan starts to really sort of turn into what I refer to as a hippie and just starts talking about the rich making themselves richer and all that nonsense. So, I'll do some price predictions, but if it's not clear at this point that HBAR is the most centralized DAG that only makes the rich richer, I mean, I won't even call it a cryptocurrency because it's not. It doesn't even deserve the right to call itself a cryptocurrency. Centralization at this level a DAG that does nothing but make the rich richer while taking everything from the little guy should be laughed out of this industry. Thing And it's complete nonsense. And what, what Ryan's talking about, he's saying that the nodes are operated by some of the largest companies in the world, which is absolutely true. But I don't think Ryan realizes that native staking is available, which basically means that you can take your HBAR, I can take my HBAR as an everyday man in the street, and we can, we can, as always with Hedera Hashgraph, it's completely open. You can see which companies are running which nodes. You can pick one yourself and you can put your HBAR on that node, earning the exact same reward as everybody else in the network. So it's really disingenuous, I think, to say that, you know, everyone who's paying these transactions, and Ryan doesn't care to mention that the transactions are absolutely minuscule, fixed and in fiat, but that's a buy, I guess. Um, he implies that only Google is getting the rewards from people who are transacting on the, on the network. And again, that's just not true. 
because if tonight you buy some HBAR, you can go on, you can stake it to whichever node you want, and then 24 hours later, you will earn the same rewards as anyone else. And I think that's a fantastic opportunity and actually really levels the playing field for the retail investor. And then at the very end of the video, Ryan starts talking about uh, how the, the tokenomics. And it's really hard to work out because it was when he's in that muddle bit in the, in the end of the video. But it, he, he, he very carefully doesn't mention the fact that about 5.5 billion HBAR have been set aside exactly for people like us. People who are looking to develop or build on the network can apply for a grant completely free of charge, really simple process, and very quickly get a grant that's, that's money you don't have to pay back in HBAR to start your business or to promote it or to hold the spaces or to be involved in the ecosystem in some way. Any man on the street, any woman on the street can, can approach the, the uh, HBAR Foundation with an idea and they could, if they're successful, be granted HBARs. And 5.5 billion HBARs have been set aside and are being distributed to the community. It's the biggest grant uh, in the ecosystem by more than twofold. And compared to most, tenfold. Um, but we don't mention that when we're talking about the distribution of the HBARs. Very finally, Ryan asks us a question. He says, if can anyone tell me why a retail investor, that's every man in the street, you and I, why she should buy HBAR? Please drop a comment below if you disagree and explain to me how a retail investor would benefit in investing in HBAR more than the suits and VCs. And I think, yeah, it's a really fair question. And I've also found out that Ryan is a big fan of Kadana, KDA. Well, I used to own one of the largest, one of the largest privately owned uh, KDA mines in the world. We accounted at one point for about 1.5 to 1.8% of the hashing power across the entire network. And I lost an absolute fortune. As will of Ryan, if he's ever owned any KDA, because if you'd bought KDA at its all time high with $1,000, today that $1,000 would be worth $37.94. If you'd bought HBAR, with $1,000, today that would be worth $80. So you would have lost three times less money, or as good as makes no difference, three times less money, if you'd bought HBAR instead of buying KDA. Yet, Ryan thinks that all retail investors should pile into KDA and stay well, well away from HBAR. Not my opinion, it's a fact. If you go on any of the coin market caps uh, or CoinGecko, have a look. KDA, all time, look at the high, look at the low, you work it out. HBAR, all-time high, all-time low. KDA has performed three almost three times worse than HBAR from its all-time high. I hope this video has been useful and I hope I've gone some way to giving you some balance in the debate. And I hope that Ryan reaches out and actually has a think about the video. Fact check me by all means, please do. And we can all learn and move on. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.